What's important? What do you want? Welcome to everyone. Thank you for coming. Let's start where we've always started by listening to the impulse to breathe. And anyone new, if you can't find the impulse to breathe, if you just don't breathe for a second, you'll find it. It'll find you. This connection of your attention with the impulse to breathe is to me the simplest, most effective way of connecting the known you with the universal you or the universe itself. This life force that breathes you, so to speak, at least at first blush, it seems to, tuning into that, listening to that begins to connect them. And I'll just repeat when I said the first couple times, if I ask you to take a deep breath, everyone can do that, everyone understands that, <sighs> everyone knows when they did it, and then I said, but when you don't do that and you're still breathing, is that you breathing or not? How shall we talk about that? And which you am I talking to? And so we played with that shift of identity or recognition that there's more to ourself than we're usually conscious of. And we've played with a lot of aspects of bringing that forward and working with it and getting to know it. But as you start listening to the impulse to breathe, as you really pay attention and move in harmony or breathe in harmony with that force, can you feel that, let's start with it this way in terms of words, that the way you feel is different. And then if I said it this way, would this be okay? That as you pay attention to that impulse to breathe, as you really listen to it, as you unify, call it the known self, with this deeper aspect or original or universal aspect, that who you are is different. It's actually a different you. You have a different outlook on life, a different feeling about being in the room. And so this unified field of consciousness, this deeper, uh, more original, uh, more universal aspect of yourself, connecting with the known self or the familiar self or the way you normally identify yourself when you Describe how you're feeling or your attitude. When they start to listen to each other, they start to merge. They start to unify. In Bob's terms, they make love. They become one system in Osensei's terminology. And that unified field of being is the approach to standing on the floating bridge. When that permeates the entire structure of being, mind, body, spirit, whatever words we use to describe the aspects of being, that's standing on the floating bridge. Because this is the fundamental that we're going to build on. We've been working on it the whole time for the four weeks, the three previous weeks. So I'm going to highlight this again, that this listening, this connecting, I call connecting with your inner teacher. And uh, as Kenneth and I were talking about, I use that term because I, I don't think it's too mystical. I think everyone can kind of relate to that. Uh, if you're in AA, you would talk about your higher self. Uh, if you're a Trekkie, you would use the force. That's your connection with the force. If you're religious, you might call it your connection with God. I like the term Aikikami. It's the way I listen to the whisperings of the Aikikami. So stay with that listening to the impulse to breathe. Feel and appreciate that difference. Appreciate it. And then I'm going to take you one more step. Seek the source of the impulse to breathe. Seek the origin of the impulse to breathe. Now there will be a tendency to go into the head and go, let's see now, where is that? But that's not at all what I'm talking about. 
I'm feeling in the same way I'm listening to the impulse itself. I'm feeling into that impulse, seeking the origin, seeking the source. As our sensei said, everything emanates from a single source. Calm the spirit, return to the source. In addition to this most important aspect of listening or connecting the totality of your being or what I call the unified field of consciousness or the unified field of being and what I believe O Sensei called the floating bridge of heaven. When you've connected this mundane or manifest aspect of self with the origin or the divine aspect of self, that force that gives you life itself. And they become connected through your awareness, through your attention, through your being. I believe that's what we're talking about in terms of standing on the floating bridge and what I call again the unified field of being. So the next important piece that I want to share with you or remind you of if you've been here is these are my stories. You have to experience them for yourself to find out if they're true. So my hope is is that those of you who've been here previously that you've played with this listening to the impulse to breathe in between times that you've used it when you've needed it you've experimented with it just in a playful spirit you know like taking a bath once a week whether you need it or not you know that kind of thing you just have played into this experience because it's your experience that matters. What I have to say here may help you connect with your experience, but all I'm interested in, in terms of our connection, is helping you tune into your essential self, to your connection with the Aikikami, to your divine source that gives you your breath of life, your aliveness, your vitality, and allows you to complete your bestowed mission. A teacher can help, but I want you to come back and take responsibility for yourself. I want you to feel that you can listen to this breath. You can listen to the origin of it. You can connect into it in a way that all of a sudden, and I told this story a week before, Osensi used to say the Aikikami would come wake him up in the middle of the night take him out in the garden and teach him Aikido, teach him movements and stuff. And then I mentioned that Bob, after I was talking about that, said, yeah, he's been finding himself waking up in the middle of the night and, and going out on the patio and writing. And I have similar stories, and mine's more musical these days, but, but there's just a, a feeling. And the, those funny sensations that call you, the ability to listen to that, to be guided in that realm and in that way so that at the course level when I started Aikido I used to say well it was less to me about doing the techniques than it was about tuning into the energy in such a way that it's always the bar, right? It's always the bar. That you've left the bar before the, the guy realizes he wants to hit you. But what that really means to me is that you actually can tell when you're doing the right job for you or you should leave that job or you should look for a different job or you should do that job but you should do it differently or you should be with a different person or you should be with that person but the way you should be with them should change and you can hear those whisperings in your own being. You don't need her or him to tell you. You don't need the boss to tell you. You don't need your teacher to tell you. You're tuning into that. And then usually you can check it out with your partner or your coworkers or your teacher and they can help you clarify that message. Here we go. Listening to the impulse to breathe, seeking the source or the origin of that and that's an experiential process. In that connection unifying the manifest and the divine, you become the floating bridge. You stand on the floating bridge and in that you become your own teacher or you become in direct connection with the universal force or the Aikikami as I like to call it. But anything that works for you, fine with me, okay? So I want to show you one more quick process we do getting into this and 
I'll highlight again, appreciating what you notice, appreciating your experience, connecting your attention with your experience when you listen to the impulse to breathe. I immediately feel a little more glow of aliveness. Sometimes it starts off just feeling a little more relaxed. And when I seek into the source of the impulse to breathe, I begin to feel connected with a larger universe. I'm hoping this is working for you. Stop me if it's not. So again, we start in these relatively easy aspects of feeling the breath. And we start to get into something a little subtler, like feeling the origin or the source of the impulse to breathe. Let's start with the physical body and align it with the force of gravity. And you can tell that you're doing that and you go forward and back and side to side a little bit until you find that place where you seem to come to rest. Where you're aligned with the force of gravity and you can usually tell because your muscles relax. Your skeleton is supporting you. More of the weight is transferred to the earth through the skeletal structure, the musculature relaxes. When the musculature relaxes, the breathing also seems to become easier or softer. And if you appreciate that as it's happening, a line that allows the muscles to relax, so you allow, and as you notice what's going on, you appreciate your experience there. We go to the next level. As you start to align in terms of feeling, in terms of aligning with how you feel, are you more vital? Are you tired? Are you attentive? Are you distracted? Just start to notice and align that with being here and bringing your attention into what's going on for you. N not trying to feel differently, just aligning with your experience. And just like when you align your physical, you don't really need to do that much and it sort of naturally seeks that balanced state. When you align spiritually, if you will, or mentally, you come more into the moment, your attention is more focused on your experience, and again, like connecting with the impulse to breathe, your power, your ability to understand your experience, that's not intellectual, to know who you are and what's going on for you, starts to increase. So you know if you're behaving in a way that's not fulfilling your bestowed mission, if you're treating the people around you in a way that's not going to help them complete their bestowed mission. These things all start to happen very naturally and the simple mundane practice of aligning, aligning with the force of breath, aligning with the physical structure, and as you start to feel that weight relax through the musculature and you feel the weight transfer through the physical structure, the skeletal structure, I'd say, where does that weight go? And you feel yourself more connected with the ground. Okay? I'm going to take you into what I call neural energy. So we've done the extraordinary listening breath. We've sought the source of the impulse to breathe. We've aligned that with becoming our own teacher or listening directly to the Aikikami or any way you want to talk about it, where you're responsible for completing your bestowed mission. You don't ask your teacher how often you should shower or what you should eat, okay? You're, you might ask them what they eat and you might learn something about how, how to consider that. But you're connecting directly with the impulses and that's why listening to your breath is important. It's fine to go study the other breaths. Uh, maybe if we hang out longer and it looks like we'll go more than the four weeks. We'll talk about uh, the in-breath, the out-breath, holding the breath, doing different counts, variations of, of many kinds of breathing that, that one learns in pranayama yoga. But right now I'm just interested in this essential experience that's you, coming into you being yourself at this moment, aligning physically with the force of gravity, aligning spiritually with how you feel, and as you do that, I'm going to take you into a slightly subtler level of feeling now. We talked earlier about the audible breath, breathing at a volume of air that you can hear, to a silent breath where you can feel the breath moving, but it's soft enough that you don't hear it. 
and I'm going to suggest that there's a similar heightening of your sensory acuity. There's a certain noticing your vitality may just appear as a little more relaxation at first or a little more glow of energy and as you start to soften the breath a little further we go from the manifest to the hidden where you can sort of feel the oxygen moving through the bloodstream to the cells if you go a little softer, we hit what, what I call the invisible breath, where you can't hear it, you can't even really feel it moving in and out of the nasal passages or the throat. It's just a, you can feel your chest expanding, but you don't feel the air in the external form moving. And you do maybe have a sense of the glow expanding through the system, through the bloodstream, but then after a minute of the invisible breath, I'm going to suggest, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you're feeling a different quality of vitality as the oxygenation takes place at the cellular level. And the cells themselves begin to breathe individually. And the combination of all of them that is the way we normally think of our corporal system, our body, our alive system, has a different glow to it. It has a different sensitivity. It has a different presence. Take one more minute and play with the invisible breath and that feeling of vitality or oxygenation through the system. And if you will, if you tune it just slightly finer, notice there are areas where you definitely feel it. There are areas where it may be a little vague or maybe you aren't sure if you feel it at all. Don't do anything about that other than appreciate it. Let's go one or two more breaths there. Now I guarantee you if you did this for 10 or 20, you would feel a complete shift, but I'm going to suggest, and I'm asking already, there's a little more equalization throughout the system. The whole system seems to unify. So this sense of recognizing the parts and recognizing the whole, and then recognizing at the same time that's standing on the floating bridge. One foot in heaven, one foot on earth, and connecting the two realms as a unified field of being. It says you start to feel the parts of the body using the invisible breath as one of the tools that we're playing with. And you notice when you bring that breath to a softer place and you start to feel more of the vitality in the body, there'll be areas that are more alive and areas that you may not notice or may not feel it oxygenating as clearly or you may not feel them at all. And I said, don't do anything about that. Just notice, just appreciate what your experience is. And then I said, if you do that for a I want to say two or three breaths, but certainly by ten. And you're again going to have to do this on your own to some degree to really inculcate it as part of your being. All of a sudden the system starts to equalize and there's a totality that begins to show up. You begin to feel not just the parts that are more and less there, but you begin to feel a unified field of being. And I think the quote, if I'm hearing you right, that I said was one foot in heaven, one foot on earth. And you become the bridge, the floating bridge of heaven that unifies the divine with the manifest realm. Your power in that state of being is different than it is when you're in either place. Uh, do stop me if you have something else you'd like to 
talk about, but I'm going to move on into a couple of uh, games here. And I'm going to stand up. You can sit or stand as is most appropriate for you. And again, stop me if there's a question or problems with the sound or anything. Okay, so usually when I push on someone, that's what happens. Unless they're ready or expecting it, then by the second time, usually this happens. And they're sort of there that way. Okay? And then I want to come back to, as you start to balance back and front, side to side, and you hit that place where, again, you align so that you can allow the muscles to relax and the weight drops further and further into the earth. Then usually if I push, the same amount of pressure won't move them. I could still push them, but, but the, that pressure that moved them the first time is not enough to move them anymore. Can you all feel that in yourself as you start to drop in? There's a little more solidity, okay, or groundedness, all right? And then if I took that another level and said as you bring your neural energy in to enliven the body, and align it so that, and I almost could give you the picture of as if there were like um, spikes coming out of the bottom of your feet and so you settle them deeper and deeper into the earth, you just become this very solid state there. You play with that a little bit and I'd say since we really, probably most of us don't have someone to do it with, you kind of have to imagine, pretend, but I think you can kind of feel it on your own. All right. then. That's what we would call centering and grounding. All right, you hit a place that's centered and grounded. So, playing with the stillness that exists in that centered and grounded state, I want to just move a little bit. You know, since they talked about movement and stillness. And I want to see, at first when you move, it disturbs that stillness. And then I want you to come back to that aligning with the earth and moving with that alignment so in effect there is a stillness if you will when you move okay you move and yet there's much more of a feeling of is it calmness is it groundedness do any of those words work okay now, the next thing we usually talk about once we're centered and grounded is that this vitality or this flow of energy uh, becomes something that we can direct as such. And so, if I ask you to put your arm up, I'm sure everybody could do it. If I asked you how you did it, I'm not sure everybody could exactly explain it, but let me try some words and see if they work for you. You think about lifting your arm. You send energy from that thinking about or mind intent to lift your arm into the nerves that activate the muscles and the muscles raise the arm. Okay? Now, if I ask you to extend energy out the fingertips, most of you being Aikido people probably can do it. In the beginning, people often don't know what that means and when I push on them, they collapse. So then what I ask them to do is just touch my hand. And once they're reaching out to touch me, their key is flowing and I can't move their arm backwards, okay? They, they're just solid. So can you play with that sense of, as if you were just going to touch somebody who was two inches beyond your fingertips. Just reach out and touch them. And if you can feel that flow of neural energy that ex extends out the fingers, then you can start to play with those imaginary, at least in the beginning, imaginary concepts of the key extends as far as you can see. There'll be a tendency for the mind to go on the idea. I want you to come back into aligning the body with the force of gravity and extending the arm. Aligning the body with the force of gravity, allowing the musculature to relax, appreciating that experience and extending the arm, and appreciating that experience. Now, I'd like you to imagine somebody pushing backwards on your hand, on your wrist. I'd like you to keep the extension there, and 
and imagine if they start to push a little harder maybe you start to feel yourself lose your balance or the totality of your being come back and align in Bob's terminology at the next level of dimensions the next finer state or the next place on your lineage of a person who's present a person who's extended or flowing or positive and then I start to imagine them pushing a lot harder and I can feel my first reaction is to kind of tighten up against it and I want to align and allow and just let the energy flow until they're pushing as hard as they can and they're not moving me okay let's do the other side In a minute maybe it takes you a second to get there but come back to align with the force of gravity connect to the earth allow the energy to flow extend reach just beyond your fingertips or as far as you care to start them pushing at a very gentle rate more and more and more okay are we okay here anybody need help with this anybody having problems with just the concept okay so if you can do that have that sense of extension and key flowing through the body from a grounded state let's go on one foot and you may or may not be able to do this very easily but don't worry about it just feel it one foot try and extend the energy and feel how stable you feel and I think you'll find you can still get a little bit of a, a presence there with an extended energy and a good groundward connection let's change to the other foot maybe the other arm then also all right and then I want you to feel what happens when you put both feet down and feel how everything just becomes a kind of a different experience once more the first foot that we used and noticing what happens is you put the other foot down and now let's have two people pushing grabbing your arm and pushing on it and squaring away to that okay all right so this sense of when both feet connect it's a little like the power that increases in the physical realm the capabilities then I'm gonna have three or four people pushing on me and since they're imaginary I can handle them really easily but I'm also playing it in such a way so that I am deepening my connection with the earth and if I go to the next finer dimension the earth is suspended in the universal energy and I'm connecting with that again at first it could be a conceptual idea but experientially after a moment it starts to change in feeling okay and as I have one foot in heaven one foot in earth I'm listening to the impulse to breathe I'm seeking the source of that breath I'm tuning into something that is so much more than the way I normally know myself and again there will often be moments in that where it'll blow you away it'll be more energy than you're used to uh, you'll start to get something that will trip you out into thinking about it it's all fine but as quickly as is appropriate no rush back to that aligning allowing and then I call center ground flow okay if we're good in that place I'll move on just a little bit further and then I'm gonna stop and chat with you but I want to take you a little further into the experience if you're with me So developing this unified field of being and you know Osensei used to do uh, I don't know five guys pushing on where he do the the Joe I love the Joe uh, you know five five feet long out there people pushing on it uh, all the stuff he used to do I don't think he was trying to impress us with parlor tricks I think he was saying when you catch this field of energy this unified field of being when you stand on the floating bridge when you actually connect the divine aspect of yourself if that word works for you or your connection to the universal force if you like to think about it that way 
and bring that sense of connection into your experience of life and you appreciate yourself as part of a totality instead of being stuck in your little problems, what I call my stinking expletive deleted attitude, uh, and you start to come back to this larger, truer, finer, more original sense of your connection to what you are, I think all of you, if you're with me now, feel it's different. You're, you're different. I'll leave it there. We'll talk about it in a minute. So, when we're in a situation, this universal energy is always responding to the situations that we're in based on our perception, and I'll bring it back, based on how we're appreciating what's going on. So if we're resisting any aspect of the experience, we're going to be less present, less alive, less effective, uh, less whole, less uh, comfortable, more reactive, uh, more afraid, more aggressive. As we start to come into this connection with the whole, our ability to, and I talked about coming out of the movie and they, they loved the movie and you hated it and you were just about to say it was terrible and they go, wasn't it great? At that point, to not be caught in a back and forth. Aikido doesn't call relative affairs good or bad, but keeps all beings in a constant state of growth and development and serves for the completion of the universe. If you're really okay with yourself, you don't need to say that you're right by not liking it or they're wrong for liking it. You're able to say to them something on the level of what did you like about it. You might learn something. You might find something out about the person. You might come to appreciate something about the movie or the universe that you hadn't noticed before. Okay? So, this state where the energy is allowed and appreciated is a very different state than when the energy is hitting us and we're starting to feel threatened, uncomfortable, wish we weren't there, uh, want to make them wrong for what they think, want to establish what we think, uh, as opposed to just being able to be present because you're, you're okay. You're part of the universe, you know that you are, and you can work with other people to help learn from them. If they're open to it, maybe you can help them learn from you. It's a different world that we live in. It creates, in his terms, reconcile the world. It creates a world where there's the ability to reconcile the fact that you liked the movie and I didn't, and we could learn something from each other or about each other through that process. It's not about right and wrong. It's an entirely different universe that exists at that point. All right? So that's where most of us go with our Aikido if, if we get that far, if we get past just doing a stronger Nikkyo and thinking that somehow that's going to make the world a better place. And if all you care about is a strong Nikkyo or defending yourself on the street, that's fine. I've got nothing against that. I just want you to be happy, dear. Okay? But as you start to pick up this, oh, you know, I noticed after I learned how to do that, I, like I learned the more centered I got, the stronger my Nikkyo was, and I get into centering more, and then the next time I got into a disagreement with someone at work, or my partner at home, or one of my kids, or uh, with myself about what I was going to do today, all of a sudden I took on a very different tone. I was standing on the floating bridge, I was connecting heaven and earth, I radiated something much more positive, much more in inquiry, much more in exploration, much more in not what do you think, but why do you think it? Not did you like it or didn't you, but what did you like about it and, and why did that please you What or didn't like or whatever. You're in a place where you're learning and growing. It's an entirely different universe. Okay? So then I want to talk about the one more shift in our work here. The thing is at first the energy hits us. It's like we start to get these reactions to the energy and we get uh, energy moving and then somebody taught us to give it a name. Oh, you're afraid. Oh, you're anxious. Oh, you're, you're whatever. Nervous. You're depressed. You're, and what I have always loved about Bob's teaching, what I've always, from the very beginning, was his recognition that 
Those things are all after effects to this connection that you have with the universe itself. And as you start to recognize that, you realize this isn't some horrible force that's affecting you. That's because you're resisting it or not open to it or not grounded and settled so that you can use it. And I think you can go ahead and dance with me if you want to. And as you start to, you recognize in, in those terms that it's an ally. You become an alchemist and you and that energy start to work together. And a lot of people think about that as, oh, that's Aikido. And what I want to say is, if we talk about the manifest, hidden, and divine realms, that starts to be towards the hidden realm. We go from doing the manifest things where we moved off the line so we can work with their energy differently. And we start to feel their energy and move with it, uh, what I call neural energy, that you can feel the energy going through their uh, intent to their nerves, to their muscles. You start to hit a much finer level, the hidden realm. Uh, and we work with that, and that's why Aikido looks so fake, because you're not affecting their physical body, you're affecting the energy that moves their physical body. And that's a giant step, all right. And it's magical, and people who can get there can do pretty good Aikido. And, um, you know, O-sensei's not touching stuff was kind of a little past that, but that's what was beginning to happen there. So this next step that starts to happen is, as opposed to you, the way you know yourself, working with the breath as if it were the impulse to breathe something happening to you, is you start to recognize that that is you breathing. That impulse to breathe is you breathing, okay? As you start to feel it that way and the two aspects unify, you're standing on the floating bridge and they're one system, then you start to recognize that you are the origin of the impulse to breathe and everything that you see afterwards is an after effect. All the things that you know about yourself are after effects from this original energy and you start to identify there. Now this already has got to be a little conceptual for most of us as we start to do it and yet I think you can kind of understand what I'm playing with here. And Bob said, he and I were talking about this the other day, kind of a long discussion about it and he was saying that was the place when Osensei said he who understands the secret of Aikido has the universe within himself and can say I am the universe. Now that's not the same I that has my stinking expletive deleted attitude. That's an entirely different I. Okay, and maybe I is no longer the right word. Bear with me. You start to recognize yourself as this entire universe that's manifesting through this particular form in time. And as such, the likelihood of you completing your bestowed mission changes dramatically. But Bob said, oh sensei said, that jump is a big one. The one to get in harmony with the energy and work with your energy and see it as an ally but still somewhat separate, that's a jump. A lot of people don't get there, but I don't think it's that hard for most of us, certainly those of us who hang into Aikido for a little while. But as you start to make that shift into, at, at that first transition level when you stand on the floating bridge in that sense, you don't know who you are. You don't know what's going on. Everything that you know dissolved into something so much, and he didn't like the word larger, he liked the word finer, but he said not something new, something more original. So let's, let's play with that word. You connect with the original source of creation and you start to see yourself as an emanation of that original source and who you knew yourself as starts to transition dramatically. All right. So I want to come back and say whatever this exploration is, if you're doing this when you go to do your Nikyo, when you go to do your Irimi Nages, with your imaginary Ukes now and with your real Ukes, if and when we ever get back to the Kodagaishi in the real dojo, good pin here, okay. And then I like to start playing with the, where I don't actually touch them, Techniques, I love those. I love playing in that realm because I'm interested in that shift into that more original dimension. I'm much more interested in connecting with the whisperings of the kami, 
than the manifestations or the power that it brings me in the world. I'm not that interested in that. I know some people are, and that's not wrong. That's just, some people like classical music, some people like country music, some people like disco, whatever. You know, some people like Mexican food, some, whatever. You're just you doing what you're doing, and I'm not telling anyone how you should be. I'm just talking to you about my process so you can find your own process. You can complete your bestowed mission, not mine, not Bob's, not O-Sensei's. Your direct connection with the Aikikami. And this sense of feeling it flowing through you. And if you're playing with me here, and I, I like the movement. I think you can do this sitting, but it's much harder to keep it honest. It's too easy to drift off into the idea realm and not notice it, whereas if you're standing up and moving, it's pretty obvious when you've lost that totality of connection that's here. And if you've got an imaginary uke, or two of them, and you're playing with that, and you can feel your groundedness and the flow throughout the whole system. So I like the movement, and I'm hoping you can take this, the breathing exercises, the uh, separating the parts of the body, feeling the whole system is a combination or a unified field of the parts that the breath and the movement are working together as a system. Okay, are you with me here pretty much? Until you start to recognize yourself as this universal energy and then it kind of shows up as you. But you're not confused anymore that that's really who you are and there's this energy that's bothering you. Or a giant step in the right direction, you're working in harmony with this energy. You're actually standing on the floating bridge where you are an expression of the divine energy. There's, I am the universe. He doesn't say I don't exist, only the universe exists. He said, has the universe within themselves and say I, the way I, I know myself is as this universal being, this part of this totality, this love, this appreciation, and that joy comes through you, and that's what you emanate to everyone else. The treasures are, Lauren, help me here, the treasures are not things or whatever, you know, he said the people want heaven, they are heaven. So let me just come up here and check our time here. Okay, I'd like to stop now in terms of the layout and say these are the fundamental pieces there's a lot more detail that we can play with in it, and um, since it looks like we're going to be under house arrest a little longer, uh, we'll do class next week and, and probably extend through May if they keep us locked up. And I am going to invite um, some other guests, I hope, to come in and talk a little bit more with us, and I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit more than I have. These four classes, I had some specific things I wanted to share with you because I didn't know if I'd ever see you again. Uh, I was going to quit teaching again and uh, there's nothing to quitting teaching. I've done it dozens of times. So, um, and my feeling about this is not that I don't like to teach. It's not I like or don't like. It's um, I want to share what I'm into in my inquiry so you can explore what you want in your inquiry and I don't really like the uh, the style that the Japanese culture has of the person in charge speaks and and no one can even ask a question you know it was that big big question that finally Henry Kono friend of Bob's Bob trained with him with O-sensei back in the old days and on one of O-sensei's birthdays Henry finally thought I could ask him a question today and he said, you know, can I ask you a question on sense? He said, sure. And he said, oh, why doesn't our Aikido look like your Aikido looks? And no sense I said, because I understand yin and yang and you don't. And I'm going to translate that as he could unify the two forces and none of the other people really could. They didn't get that. They learned the movements. They did it enough. They were around him enough that, like I, I joke, you know, if you hang out with Bob, you smell like cigarettes. You know, in uh, Indian culture, they use the term darshan. You just sit near the foot of the master. And um, quick story here. I, I was training one night. There were an odd number of people in class. This was back at the church. 
And this was probably when we first got mats because we'd been training for some time with no geese, no mats, no picture of O-sensei, no Japanese words. I think we got a couple mats and we were doing some sitting practice or something and Bob came over and worked with me. I worked with him for like five minutes and man, it was just like I was so much better. It was, it was, and so uh, Bill Gleason who trained right after O-sensei died said when he got there, all the people who had trained with O-sensei, they had something special. By the time it was their students, not so much. And so there was something that was transmitted just by being there, but this is the story I'm getting to and appreciate your patience with me here. Bob was there, uh, 67, 68, I can't exactly place it, he could maybe. Um, and he said he'd been there and he'd been training with all the top guys, you know, and getting his few private lessons with Mr. Tohei and connect, starting to connect with O-sensei. And they went to the All Japan demonstration, which Bob and I had the pleasure of going to when I went to Japan with him 20 some years ago. And, um, he, but this was when O-sensei was alive. And he said he watched, you know, the seventh dons, the eighth dons, the ninth dons, the tenth dons get out and demonstrate. And he said they were fantastic. And then O-sensei came out and O-sensei said, what they're doing, that's not what I'm doing. Okay, and I'm going to repeat this story that I told last week of one of the deshi who had said, O-sensei always said, you must stand on the floating bridge of heaven. If you do not stand on the floating bridge of heaven, you cannot do Aikido or Aikido will not come forth. And he said, but we didn't know where it was or how to stand on it, so we just put on a good face and kept applying techniques to each other. And then these are the people who went out primarily and taught Aikido. And in you know, Osensei's words, what they're doing, that's not what he was doing. So I don't mean to denigrate anyone or say that we can't learn a lot from all these people. I want to bring you back to your direct connection with the Aikikami and don't listen to anything I'm saying listen to what's going on inside you and play with some of these ideas and the ideas that other teachers give you but find out what's true for yourself okay so I'm gonna leave it there for a couple minutes I think we may have used up enough of our time today that I'd I'd like to hear if indeed there's anything you'd like to share uh, could be a question could be a comment could be an insight uh, feel free to challenge anything I've said. Like I said, I don't know anything. I'm just experiencing it myself. I never felt like a teacher. I never felt like I knew any of this stuff. I just got in and I played with it. And like I said, one of my favorite compliments that I ever got was when someone said, I, I couldn't figure out what you were doing, then I realized you weren't teaching. You were just learning out loud. So I see us as studying together. Like I say, maybe I've been around longer. Maybe I can be helpful. But uh, as my grandma used to say, the chickens can learn from the eggs. So take a minute, think about it, feel into yourself, feel where you are, get in harmony with yourself, get in harmony, harmonious relationship with us as a group together, and share who you are. If you've got anything you'd like to share, I don't expect anything, but you're more than welcome, and I'd love to hear from anyone who would like to contribute to the conversation. And Laura and Kenneth. Yeah, please. I'd like to kick it off with a question. All right, so uh, my question is, you have just explained and made a very passionate exhortation to, for each of us to connect to the Aikikami to connect to O-sensei's vision. Um, and you have explained that what many teachers have taken away from Aikido is not different from what O-sensei did or, or talked about or we can see in the, in the, you know, in the videos and the films. So in that context, what is the role of the teacher in Aikido? That's my question. What is the role of the teacher in the, uh, giving, given all of the things you've said so far about the importance of everyone making a direct connection to the Aikikami to 
nature to the, their con own connection to the universe, or for even that matter, to Aikido itself. Is there a, still a role for the teacher? And, and, and what is it? You're a veteran teacher yourself. I'm very interested to hear your thoughts, please. Beautiful. Um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it into two directions at once. The first direction I'm going to take it is, Lauren, I want you to take that question to yourself. And next week, I'm going to actually ask you to come forward with your answer to that question, if you would be willing. And uh, as expected, perfect. I see well. <laughs> and um, and I think we can take that discussion or dialogue or inquiry a little further, uh, based on the combined understanding that we share together, but. Uh, just to show you what a nice guy I can be, rather than making you come up with that answer right now, I will answer you what I feel you're asking me about. And what I think the role of the teacher is, is to help the student connect with themselves. Now, that may be if you're teaching, um, and what you think Aikido is, is a strong technique, then you would teach your students what you understand about how they can have a stronger technique. Not impressing them with the fact that your technique is stronger than theirs, but much rather looking at their work and telling them what you think you can give them to make their technique stronger. If you think Aikido is getting more in harmony with themselves, then that's what you would teach them to do. If you thought it was more in getting harmony with a universal energy, that's what you would teach them to do. And if you thought it was unifying with the universe in such a way that you stand on the floating bridge of heaven and become the expression of creativity itself, the creation's creativity itself, then that's what it would be your game to do. And the way I talk about that, Lorna, I, I used to say, um, you know, I trained with an awful lot of teachers. And in the beginning, I was like a junkie. I mean, that nobody came through that I didn't go see. I went to every dojo that was around. I, I did everything, and plus studying, you know, half a dozen other martial arts besides Aikido, plus yoga and some other spiritual practices. I was really looking for something, and I, I knew there was something on the martial edge, so I really made myself available to it and I thought Aikido was really the one for me so I, I went and saw all these people and I saw an awful lot of people you know showing their techniques and then uh, you would get a bit of this uh, Mr. Tohei used to say now I teach you right way and and I, I think you know he was so good this guy was so good that he could sort of say that but I don't think it was the right way to approach it. I think the right way would have been to say, let me show you what's working for me and let me explain to you why it works. And I want you to try it and see if that works for you. And if it does or doesn't, come back to me with the question so we can explore together what would work better for you. If you can help them, what I liked to demonstrate when I was uh, teaching was my mistakes and then I would correct them. And my sense was to show the students, uh, as O-sensei said, my students think I don't lose my center, but that's not true. I simply recognize it sooner and I get back quicker. And my sense is it's not about being perfect. He said, where I am, this is kindergarten. And that was at the end of his life when you know, he was the absolute master, at least in the stories we have. And uh, his willingness to be a learner to show himself as a learner, to show himself in the inquiry and growing, I think that's the best thing a teacher can do. That's an opinion. That's my story. You have to explore it for yourself and find out what's true for you. But is that good enough to start and leave you with something to work on so we can talk about it next week? Is there anything more you want to go to? Is there anything you'd like Thank to add? You so Thank you. I'd like to encourage other Mute their microphones to ask and say a question. Please.
Richard. This is Carl. Hi, Carl. Can you hear me? Sure. Good. Loud and clear. I agree. I think you're doing a great job providing a perspective, and uh, it's helping me. And I think about the shadow side. It is the coronavirus standing on the floating bridge. Don't create negative stuff. Well, it's here. And our ability to relate to it for us at least is our Aikido and I don't think that doing Aikido means you're not gonna die as you look around there are no survivors on this earth but I think it's much more a question of how you live and if you will, how you die. And so my sense is, is that death is a natural part of the cycle. Sort of like, I kind of joke about, well, which side are you on? Breathing in or breathing out? Night or day? You know, uh, talking or listening. And I feel like you've got to recognize these things are part of a unified field. They're part of a system and that each of us will be called in our own time to terminate this existence on earth. And so I think what, what I see here is a potential for us to learn. Do I like it? No, not necessarily. I don't like being sick or whatever, but when that happens I do my best to be as with it as I can in the best way that I can be and to bring whatever comfort to those around me that I can offer and whatever strength I can share to make our journey here a little better. And uh, when we hit the spaces where there are grief and sorrow, where you get hurt training Aikido, uh, experiencing the pain is your job, as it were. That's being in harmony with what's going on. Now there's a difference between experiencing it and indulging it. And there's a place where uh, when you can, I don't know if you've ever played this game, but sometimes if you've got a headache, you can actually send your attention into the pain itself and it begins to soften it or heal it. Certainly being present with your experience heals a sprain or whatever. I do believe that being present with your grief is how you move through it and resisting your grief is what keeps you stuck in it and eventually turns it into a, if I can use the expression, a putrefied system that then toxifies everything in your life. And you know people like that whose pain is still with them from, I have a friend who's a musician, he had a really bad experience with the band he was with. They got really big and, and they kicked him out and he was with them for about a year and a half. He's still bitter about it. It was 50, almost 60 years ago, 55 years ago. And my sense is I understand, I actually have a couple friends who've been through bad experiences in the music business. I've, I've had my own share, but my feeling is that the Aikido and the yoga and the spiritual practice of aligning with my um, connection to the universal uh, has made it so that I don't feel I carry it in a negative way. I still am able to enjoy my music and uh, I don't have a lot of bitterness about the songs that were stolen or the, the famous story of Bill Graham called me up and wanted to um, take on my career as it were. And he was very excited about some of the work I was doing and uh, as he said it was, um, I think he said, called it beautiful. And those of you who've heard some of my night nurses work can only appreciate how funny that is. But um, he told me he would, he would give me a call and we would go to work. 
and then two weeks later he was dead in the helicopter crash. And I must admit, there's a place in there where I kind of want to say to God, what, what were you doing? What were you thinking? You know? But there's another place where it was after that loss, as it were, of you know, the, the dream of any musician who, who wants to share their music. And I was never that much into the fame or the money, but I, I always was into the joy that music created for me and sharing that. And I thought I was really going to get an opportunity to share some of what was fun for me with the rest of the world. And uh, it was gone. It was taken away. And it was after that couple years, actually, and I think in part because of Aikido and my positive spirit, that I started to get into the listening work. And that's when I got into the uh, corporate world and the um, international peace building, uh, some of which was very, very magical stuff for me. And would I have rather been a rock star? Probably. But do I feel blessed that I got to take the path I did? I do. I don't know if that helps, but that's what comes to mind as you ask your question. You're doing great, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren, what time is it? It's 5 or 6. I'll go another 10 or 15 minutes if you'd like, and we can wrap it up if you're done, but I'm, I'm here for you and, and actually would love to hear from you as much as, as answer your questions, just anything that's up for you. I'm, I'm curious how, how you're interpreting the work that we're doing together and how you're using it, and some little part of me is going like, are you using it? Are you doing this stuff on your own? Are you doing some of these movements? Are you doing some breathing exercises? Are you watching your alignment with your spirit and your bestowed mission and how you're interacting with people in a way to create more love and harmony and joy in the world? And what can you teach us about how the rest of us can do it better? Uh, pardon me, how natural is it to have doubts? I think super natural. You know, breathing in, breathing out. There are moments of sureness and there are moments of doubt. There are moments of kind of clarity and there are moments of confusion. And if you attach to one side versus the other, if you're one of those people who's so spiritual that you can't function in the physical world, or you're so into whatever the, the physical thing would be, you know, material possessions or, you know, power in the, in the uh, mundane world or something like that, uh, you've heard the expression, maybe you're just as half-assed, whichever cheek you've got left. So I think that doubt is part of the doorway to the inquiry that causes you to then reassess it because, and I'll quote O-sensei here, yesterday's technique won't be good enough today. And today's technique won't be good enough tomorrow. And I'm not sure if this is from him or not. I, I think it might be, but I, I can't confirm this. And I don't know, Lauren, if you have heard this before. But the one that I love is the purpose of today's training is to defeat yesterday's understanding. I did a class one time uh, for Bob's division uh, when they got together and, and my basic explanation was this. It's like if you start to learn this basic centering and grounding, you get a little more aligned with yourself. All of a sudden you're relaxed, you're more open, the energy is flowing through and you feel centered, grounded, flowing. You feel better. And as the Dalai Lama said, everybody wants to feel better and nobody wants to feel worse. And so you hit that level as you start to square away to being in Bob's terms a, a 10 pounder or whatever and you just, you feel good as a 10 pounder. And right about then, the next dimension starts knocking on the door. And you'll start to feel like, uh, is this all there is? Or actually uncomfortable with it. It'll start to feel weird. And then now I'm going to go back and give you a funny story. One of the senior teachers said he was very into the form style and he said, well, if you get your form perfect, then all that magical stuff will start to happen. And one day he was doing his jokata and he said he started to get this sense of something. He didn't know how to describe it. It was like champagne bubbles or something. Now to me, that's clearly the energies 
knocking. The next dimension of awareness is knocking on the door. And he said, I don't know what that was. That was just totally weird. I had to get back to my form. And to my mind, he shut the door. He had done something to square away to a certain level. The next level was knocking. He stopped it right there. And as far as I can tell in my experience with the gentleman, he never moved any further. He was a great teacher of form and I learned a lot from him. And, you know, really respected what he did in his study, but it was not my study. My study was always connecting with the totality of the universe, connecting with the Aikikami. My, my feeling is as soon as you square away to wherever, whatever dimension you're in, um, the next dimension starts knocking and all of a sudden it's a little disturbing and it's, you know, it doesn't feel that great always. But if you hang in and start to allow it to disturb you, to defeat yesterday's understanding and be in that, gee, I don't know what's going on right now. Uh, one of my dear friends and training partners way back, uh, you know, we, we used to joke about it that it's like all of a sudden you feel like you're starting to get worse. You've been training, everything's getting better and you feel like you're starting to get worse. That's the next dimension showing up. And if you can square away to that, and just be okay with it and be in the doubt or confusion or, you know, you don't know what's going on. You don't even know if you like it. Uh, it could be like grief. It could be upset. It could feel disturbing on any level. But as you start to square away in that realm, after a little while, you quote unquote find the eye of that hurricane. And you start to center into it and all of a sudden it starts to feel a little bit better. And eventually at some point a whole new level of power starts to show up. So I would say doubt is more than part of it. It's an important part of it. It's half of the system, if you will. It's the inquiry into the next dimension of who you are and what's possible. And I think that's what we're about in the sense of rely on harmony to activate your manifold powers and create a beautiful world. So I hope that helps a little bit. Yes, doubt is, is to me, it's, it's the willingness to um, acknowledge the limitations of the dimension you're in and open the door to entering the next dimension. And without it, I think you pretty much stay stuck at the size you're at or the dimension uh, or level of understanding. So uh, I welcome it. I thank God there's a mystery. I hope that helps. That helped a great deal. Thank you. Thank you. So, could you, Richard, um, address how you use dimensionality when you're performing on stage? Interesting thought. Um, yeah, I think the the uh, uh, it's a, it's a good question actually because that that for me like for me Aikido was you know like a hobby. I was never. A martial artist. I never thought I was going to be a martial artist. I probably wanted to be a dancer more and I was just playing around with it and had a great time and like I said I don't think anyone had more fun on the mat than I did. I don't know that I had more than anyone else but but I'm sure I you know uh, I love that part of the game. When I play music it's like it's my central core. It's it's if I were put on earth to do anything it's probably in that realm and so when I'm on stage sometimes uh, I often will perform a song and almost have no idea what happened. I, I just, uh, it's fun watching the videos or something sometimes because it's almost as if something else in, inhabits my body. And then when I think of uh, Sensei talking about the golden light filling his body and whatever, and he, there are moments like, and not at that level, but moments that, that remind me of that story um, when I'm on stage. So my sense really with it is um, it is that exact experience of all of a sudden who I am and how I know myself starts to change and if I can just let that happen and not be afraid that I'm gonna do it wrong or people aren't gonna like it you know what did Rumi say I want to sing like the birds sing without caring what it sounds like or who's listening and when I can let myself go to that, that's when I feel like it starts to happen. And uh, we have a saying in, in music, and I'm sure there are parallels to it in other arts, but um, you know, if I practice less than eight hours a day, I know it. If I practice less than six, 
The guys I play with know it. If I practice less than four, any musician would know it. And if I practice less than two, even the audience knows it. And so my sense, usually when I would come off, I couldn't, I didn't really gauge whether the audience liked it or not. I usually got pretty good, pretty good reactions. But, but when the musicians would tell me, hey, that was great, uh, that's when I kind of felt like, okay, that, that helps me know that I'm headed in the right direction. And sometimes that was as good as I could get because uh, in the fight itself, I couldn't do much other than just give myself over to performing, you know, letting it do the, the, the do itself or whatever, just trying to allow as much as possible. So, uh, but I did have a sense of um, playing with that as I would approach a, a gig, you know, driving there, setting up, stuff like that. I would try to remember to do my little practices to square away, to open, to settle, to allow, to let myself go, because after that, it just took over. And um, I think, you know, I've never really been in fights per se, or maybe way back when. But, you know, that's how it is. It just takes over. So it's a question really of saying yes to the transition of how you know yourself. And I think it almost brings us back to that last question where you're entering the unknown. And your willingness to do that allows... Uh, today's training to defeat yesterday's understanding. So all, all I think I can say is, um, as one of my friends said, I just said yes. He's a multi, multi-millionaire. Someone said, how, 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 what do you attribute your success to? And he said, I just said yes. To me, that's Aikido in a way. Just saying yes to your own energy and then squaring away to it, allowing it to be what it is. Uh, enjoying those moments where you're right in the center of it and then enjoying those moments when the next dimension starts knocking and you're back to the doubt or the questioning or the unknown again and doing that process. To me the fun part of when I would get a lot of, um, we did all freestyle practice, I, I shouldn't say we never did techniques but I will tell you this, there was one night when I taught in, uh, on, when we were in Oak Street, and Kenneth probably remembers this, I said to everybody at the end of class, I want you to mark this on your calendars. This was the only night I ever only taught technique. Uh, we always did Giawaza. We did freestyle stuff. People loved to challenge me. And my thing was, it was that moment where you felt like you, you didn't know what was happening. You didn't know what to do at that moment. You were completely not in control. The potential for quote unquote losing was strong. And being able to stay in the flow at those moments, um, that's where the magic happened for me. And um, as Einstein said, intelligence is not what you know how to do. It's what you do when you don't know what to do. And to me, I was grateful for those moments because they would allow that to manifest. So that's what I think our practice is, defeat yesterday's understanding to let Aikido become, and I use Aikido in a really broad sense here, uh, to let it, our study, our inquiry, our growth and development take us to places that we could never have imagined. And, and my life has been a manifestation of that. And, uh, and I feel like what I went to learn was how to, how to follow the path, how to respond to completing my bestowed mission. And like I said, I've been taken places, and including the international peace building work that was just, I never knew how I got there. You guys don't know, I never graduated high school. I ran away when I was a kid. But um, I did my study, and I feel like I've been blessed with these opportunities, and I think they come from just living in that positive spirit and uh, a sincerity uh, of you know, recognizing my own vulnerability and sharing that as much as I share my strengths so that we can work together and grow together. And that's why I don't want to be the teacher and I'll teach you how to do it. I, I wouldn't know how to do that anyway. On that note, we're thinking it's exactly 520. Uh, Thanks, Richard. Voice of calling for more questions or signing off? I'd say if, if if we'd like to give it one last minute or, or two minutes, I'm not in a rush. 
And if everybody's done, I'm, I'm fine e either way. So I want to take just a second and say if there's something out here anyone would like to share, bring into the dialogue or whatever, we're open. I have a question. My other thing I like in New Zealand. Please. I just wanted to um, share, but also give your response to when you're squared away, centered, connected, the energy can flow through you. And you. You used the word "use" in the in the in the class earlier today, and that's a word that um, you know, a long time ago in the beginning I, I understood wasn't necessarily a healthy word in that particular context. That one of the great secrets of any of the inner arts was that when you get to this place and the energy does flow through you, that's exactly what happens. You become a channel. If you then try to take that and use it for your own selfish purposes, it doesn't work, or it certainly won't work as well. Um, and just what, yeah, what your response to that is? Well, I'm back to um, see. It depends on which you we're talking about. When you, the universe, wants to use the energy, that's exactly right. When you, a separate being, who's set against the universe, wants to use it to somehow fight with the universe in any form, I'd say it leads to nothing but sorrow. But that's why the shift is less the concept of are you using it or not, it's more a question of who you are, meaning what intent is driving that use of the energy or that application of the energy. So to me, again, this shift in identity the recognizing yourself not in opposition to it, not in opposition to even someone who's attacking you, but finding a way to work with their intent. And I think for most of us, let's just set aside the physical aspect of the art, which I think it's equally true in, maybe not quite the same way, or it's certainly not as visible, as when someone's attacking you emotionally, the ability to be present with their emotional attack, move off the line, meaning not block it or stop it or make them wrong, but to allow them to express it and really try to understand the source of the impulse that they're expressing. As you start to connect with that, I think you help to bring them back to what it is that they need. And then we can look to s solving or satisfying each other's needs in ways that are reasonable and appropriate. Um, and it serves for the completion of the universe. So, again, I think one could hear the word use, uh, but I'd say, who's listening? I could say one could use the energy, but which you are we talking about? So, that could be part of our dialogue for Monday night or, or next week or next time, uh, unless you want to add anything at the moment. No, that's good, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Going once, going twice. Hi Richard, this is Pete and Gare from New Zealand. Please. It's been a long time since we talked. Um, I'm sorry, who is it? Training human. In my training recently, I've been trying to think of connection with the planet we sit on and the, and the space we live in. Um, the natural world around me and focusing less uh, from the inside out with the outside in um, and I have a feeling that um, the planet isn't happy with us <laughs> um, do we as people who want to connect to the universe have a role to play in spreading a connection and an energy to help sustain the planet we live on. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. And I think uh, one of the guys, uh, a teacher called me the other day and he said, you know, God's put us on a giant time out and sent us to our rooms to think about what we've done. I thought that was cute. I think that there is a potential here for us to take a look at the values that we're living to. And I, to tell you the truth, 
what I get from O Sensei was he was trying to tell us. But I, as far as I can tell, Jesus told us about 2,000 years ago, this economic system is unsustainable. I think there have been dozens of people, Paul Ehrlich and the population bomb was obviously the classic one, who were saying, you know, we really need to pay attention to how many people fit on the spaceship and the quality of life we're going to have depending on how many billions of people we try and put into a Volkswagen. And so I think all these things are colliding in a certain way to cause us uh, to think about it. And, uh, and I'm not sure that we have the intelligence to speak to each other in a way that allows us to stay in a learning mode here and start to reconsider how we might live together. I'm not sure that we can do it in a way that will make us sustainable and yet the funny thing about this is, and I think it's been a devastating experience for a lot of people, uh, the talk about the fact that you pick the, the city now, that people are seeing blue sky, that they can breathe the air, that you know, maybe, maybe could be stimulating the idea that we need to do something differently. We need to value things differently than just more material possessions, more consumption, uh, growing the economy in the sense of gross national product. Uh, what a funny term that is, huh? So I'm, I'm hoping that that's possible. I'm not sure that it is, but let's say a prayer together that somehow it causes us to realign our spirit towards what Osensei said when he said, you know, it's not material things. And he said joy is the greatest treasure and to point ourselves toward what truly brings us joy. And back to Mike's point, actually, you know, not what satisfies the ego in its small state, but a way to shift ourselves to a sense of connection with the larger whole, which I think creates a much more intelligent response. That's my prayer and that's why I'd leave that one for the moment. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Last one, if there is one. Hello, Richard. Joanna. Hi. Hi. Um, it's not a kind of a question, but, but just some thoughts that we could uh, share about this probably today or at the dialogue. Um, in this invisible breathing, uh, it took me a while to feel it. Uh, uh, the first time, I thought that I was kind of with, uh, with a short breath and lack of breathing. And then when it started to go longer and slowly and more silent, and then I think I, I got that to, to that place of the invisible breathing. And uh, on the other hand, but uh, in the same connection, came to me that uh, I also practice Kinomichi. And in Kinomichi, they don't use the word uke and age. It's just a partner. And both of them are active and active. It's not that one is giving the, moment, the movement and the other is receiving and, and uh, the, the opposite thing. And uh, I was thinking that this time right now of our time that we are most of us practicing by ourselves, how can we use this invisible breathing and, and all of this uh, state of fullness and, and wholeness to, to try to in the future uh, practice like an activate partner and not like an okay or nage? How could we just keep uh, developing this so we can be uh, uh, equal to the other one? I'm just responsible for the movement, being uh, an okay, as the same as I would be the nage. I don't know if that was uh, clear, but just some thoughts that came over. Well, I would say let's, let's hold some of that for the dialogue because there's a lot there. Um, but my short answer for the moment as we wrap it up today would be a, a little like I've said, I think, to several of you in a funny way is, Bring that question back to yourself and play with it. We used to do a forum I called Aiki Dance, one of my 
partners was a dancer and he and I took the two forms together and like I said I probably was more into being a dancer than a martial artist anyway and just took the idea of tuning into the key the energy the feeling the impulse to breathe and the impulse to move and just even if it starts out as very little or whatever and maybe it helps to put on some music uh, just play with letting that connection with the universal energy express itself through the breath and through the movement and if it brings you joy then good that's all we're talking about and if you think there's something you could do that would bring you more joy do that and that would be especially in terms of the movement or the stillness whatever calls you at the moment and listening to what's going on for you so I'll wrap it up this way Joanna for now and we can talk on Monday or or whenever next class or, or offline but um, all the other classes that you go to and going to learn all the things that any other teacher might want to show you all good uh, seek any knowledge that you can come across uh, going to a yoga class and having someone show you postures going to an Aikido class and having someone show you techniques that's all fine uh, you can learn from that but especially if you're tuning into yourself uh, and learning what works for you and you're really connecting with yourself but the thing that I'm hoping you will do in addition to all of that that you may or may not do is listen to what impulse drives you the breath the movement the spirit the attitude the arts the travel the um, dialogue the inquiry let it come forth and emanate through the essence of your being and that exploration right there should last you for the rest of your life thank you very much I'll leave it there thank you great to have you great for you all to be here thank you for coming thanks for hanging in thanks for the contributions you've made uh, I will leave it again I'm offline available you know I think you all know how to reach me I want to thank Lauren and Kenneth they always do so much to make this possible thanks to you again and I'll see you Monday night if you care to join us for the Ike dialogue session and I guess I'll be here next week on Saturday same time same station thank you all very much <laughs>